Hello, this is Dr. Gomez from the University of Texas Health San Antonio. Today we're going to be presenting the MSK radiology unique cases from the Instagram and Facebook page. I'm going to be presenting only three cases at a time, so it doesn't get too long, and I'm going to, I'm going to try to do it as often as possible. So the first case we saw recently, sagittal images T1 and T2 with fat suppression of the knee joint. And we see a well-defined mass at the infrapatellar fat pad, also known as the Hoffa's fat pad. It shows regions of intermediate and low T1 signal intensity as well as low T2 signal intensity. Inside the lesion, we see some regions of intermediate to high T2 signal intensity. There is no significant surrounding edema. This lesion is anterior to the tibial attachment of the ACL. As you can imagine, it probably is causing impingement and mechanical problems. We have a coronal T2 fat suppressed image, and we see that this lesion is right here at the infrapatellar fat pad. We can again see the low T2 signal intensity. Axial proton density images with fat suppression, we see here at the infrapatellar fat pad the same mass. We can see it in all sequences, easy to see, as it is a well defined encapsulated mass. So the differential diagnosis for an infrapatellar fat pad mass just by location will be what this is, a focular nodular synovitis, which, we're gonna, which we are going to discuss. Also, we can have hophitis, which is idiopathic inflammation of the infrapatellar fat pad, which is also known as the Hoffa's fat pad. That's why it's known as hophitis. Also, you can have stophaceous gout that accumulates the, at the infrapatellar fat pad. Uh, we can have synovitis, which is associated to an inflammatory arthropathy or an infectious arthropathy. And also, if patient had prior arthroscopy and repair of the ACL, we can have a cyclops lesion, which is fibrosis of the infrapatellar fat pad. Focal nodular synovitis is focal PVNS, pigmented velonodular synovitis. PVNS is a metaplasia of the synovium. The synovium just proliferates too much and it grows fast and because it grows too fast it bleeds and when it bleeds it leaves all these blood products and that's why this lesion is low on t1 and t2 because it has hemosiderin deposition it usually may show subtle enhancement pvns comes in three flavors let's say flavors the diffuse intraarticular one which is that you have all these pseudo masses all around the articulation um, then you have the focal nodular synovitis, which is less common. It's just this pseudomass, but only seen in a focal region of the articulation. And also PVNS can happen at the tendon sheath and is known as giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath. Histologically, they are very, very similar. And we, are, we call them all PVNS, but we just define it different depending on if it's diffuse, focal in the articulation, or it happens within the tendon sheath. The treatment for PVNS and focal nodular synovitis is synovectomy. Obviously, when it's focal, it is easier uh, to remove, and also the recurrence itch is much lower when it's focal than diffuse type. That's why it's important to make the distinction in our imaging findings. This is a benign condition and has no risk of metastasis. And in some books, you will always see the differential diagnosis of PVNS from synovial chondromatosis. They're both metaplasias of the synovium. Synovial chondromatosis usually ends up calcifying, known as synovial osteochondromatosis, and PVNS never calcifies, so it's lesion that never calcifies. Also, good to remember about PVNS is that it is monoarticular, only happens in one articulation. The second case we have is a four-foot MRI axial to the foot on T1, T2 fat sat, and T1 fat sat post canonignon. And what we have is prominence of fat at the dorsal aspect of the forefoot. Uh, this fat in the subcutaneous region is as high as the subcutaneous fat, but it has some regions of intermediate signal intensity. When we suppress the fat, there is no homogeneous fat suppression, which see some regions that remain slightly high with septations. And when we give contrast, we can actually see that 
there is uh, pretty homogeneous fat suppression of the subcutaneous fat, but, they, but, it, but there is not at the region of the prominence. So this is a subcutaneous lipoma. We're going to talk about soft tissue lipomas in general terms. The more the superficial the lipomatous lesion is, the better the probability of being benign. As we get deeper in the body, the probability in general term increases uh, to be atypical. So more probability an intramuscular lipoma, intramuscular, peritoneal, and when it goes to the retroperitoneum, we consider any lipomatous lesion malignant until proven otherwise. When we see these lesions uh, on MRI, what we need to do is measure them. If it's measured more than 10 centimeters, it's considered a typical just by size alone. We need to measure the fat suppression. The fat suppression, it should have homogeneous fat suppression. When you fat suppress, it should look as black or as homogeneous fat suppression as the surrounding supercutaneous fat. And it should have no enhancement which is not the case in, in, in this in here. Also, we need to measure for septations inside uh, the lipomatous lesion. Any enhanced septation that measures more than two millimeters is suspicious for an atypical lesion. So size, more than 10 centimeters, septations that enhance more than two millimeters, homogeneous fat suppression, if there is no homogeneous fat suppression, that is bad, and if there is central enhancement, also that is bad. Keep in mind that most of these leash, palpable lesions, uh, the clinician will get an ultrasound, and, and although we can see them and measure them, usually ultrasound is not adequate to completely evaluate uh, all these characteristics that we see in MRI. Also, please keep in mind that when the lipoma is within the muscle, it may splay the muscle fibers, and some of the muscle fibers may look as enhancing septations. So we have to keep an eye on that. So this is soft tissue, lipomatous lesion, uh, when we evaluate them by imaging. And the last case shows radiographs of a hip and a patient with prior arthroplasty of the hip. And we see in this case that there is asymmetric placement of the femoral head component within the acetabular cusp. There is more space inferior than superior this is what is commonly known as polyethylene wear of the acetabular component of a hip arthroplasty and obviously happens because of polyethylene wear. Also, in this image, we see that there is lucency around the acetabular component, at the medial acetabulum and superior acetabulum, and we also see a fracture at the medial acetabulum. This is particle disease, which we know, which is also known as wear. And particle disease is osteolysis associated to a hardware or a foreign body uh, that is uh, placed in the bone. Uh, so this interchangeable um, terms where and particle disease are the same. So pretty much what happens is that this osteolysis is caused by the macrophages that are activated and trying to eat all this debridement and foreign little bodies released by the hardware and this macrophage release cytokines that eat up the bone and that's why it looks loosened. There are different types of wear depending on the hardware material. It can be polyethylene, metals or ceramics and also on the mechanism of osteolysis. It can be abrasive, adhesive, volumetric related to third body or linear. So the progression of wear is that you have hardware debris accumulation related to release from the hardware then that will cause the osteolysis as we explained. This of course will start causing micromotion because that osteolysis is loss of bone and that micromotion will get even more debris dissemination so it's a positive feedback that keeps getting things worse. Um, so here we have two types of I guess wear. Wear of the acetabular cause polyethylene wear due to excessive axial loading on a hip arthroplasty and wear, which is also known as particle disease, uh, that is debris released from the hardware and causes osteolysis of the bone by release of cytokine by the macrophages. Uh, both of these uh, findings usually need a revision of the hardware uh, to correct this abnormality. 
Please note that perihardware lucency can also seen with loosening infection and also with metallosis. Thank you.